Welcome everyone to Textile Talk. As we have all of you joining us, my name is Laura Chapman and I'm the Communications Coordinator at the International Quilt Museum. And it is my honor to introduce you to today's speaker and to tell you a little bit about Textile Talks. We're so happy you could join us today. Um, in case this is your first Textile Talk, a little bit about it. Textile Talks features weekly presentations and panel discussions from several organizations, including the International Quilt Museum, Modern Quilt Guild, Quilt Alliance, San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, Studio Art Quilt Associates, and Surface Design Association. The programs are held online every week at 2 p.m. Eastern, and we have uh, recordings of the videos available afterwards. We hope you will tune in next week for Textile Talks when the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles presents tribute to the civil rights movement, Quilted Swing Coats by Patricia A. Montgomery. And again, that's gonna be at 2 p.m. Eastern. And information for registration will be sent out to all of you who are watching, and we'll also have it available on several of our websites. Today, Sarah Walcott from the International Quilt Museum will give a presentation on care and conservation behind the scenes at the International Quilt Museum. At the museum, it is our honor to preserve our collection for future generations to enjoy and study. If you would like to help us in that pursuit, we hope you will consider donating to our preservation fund. I will provide a link for that in the chat in just a moment here, but we'll also have it in the video's description in the later recording. Today's talk will be available for viewing later on our YouTube channel. Now to introduce you to Sarah. Sarah Walcott is the International Quilt Museum's Collections Manager. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in English and a Master's of Arts in Textile History with a concentration in quilt studies from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Before joining our team full-time, she interned at the museum in a number of capacities, including um, collections, exhibitions, education, and now as the collections manager, she accessions and deaccessions objects, prepares objects for photography, prepares and receives shipping shipments, processes loan agreements and contracts, maintains the museum's database, and just a bunch of other functions that she's gonna to talk to you about today. Sarah's work has also appeared in, ex in some of her exhibitions, including Hand and Mind in 19th Century Quilt Making, a photography exhibit she did of quilts from our collection. So with that, I'll turn things over to Sarah. We're so glad to have you here today. Thanks, Laura. All right. So as Laura said, today we will be chatting about care and conservation at the International Quilt Museum. Um, you all are probably familiar with many of our quilts as you see them on social media, on our website, or in person. So today we just wanted to talk a bit about what goes on behind the scenes to take care of our collection and how we go about that. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is just arrivals and departures at the museum. Uh, as you can imagine, there's a pretty steady stream of quilts coming in and a pretty steady trickle of quilts going out at any given time, just uh, because we are frequently receiving um, and returning loans in addition to our acquisitions. So here you can see this is kind of what we might receive on a fairly average day. This would be a little more than usual, but not too much more on a regular day. Um, we usually get at least one, an average of at least one or two quilts a day um, per, for acquisitions. And then um, often we're receiving loaned pieces as well. So you can see that um, shipping can take several different forms, kind of depends on who's sending it. Um, when we send things out and for certain exhibitions that we borrow, we use art shippers to just make really sure that everything stays climate controlled the entire time. Um, but for most of our shipments, we're able to use FedEx and we just take precautions to make sure that the quilts are protected in their journey. And um, so far that's worked out really well for us. Um, so when we are shipping or receiving, we really take care to make sure that our quilts stay safe. Um, so that means, for example, if we're shipping quilts out to another institution on a loan, um, we would fold them to this almost the size of the box and then um, determine how many will fit in a box stacked on top of one another without being too crowded 
And then those would all be wrapped in a cotton bed sheet. Um, and that would be placed inside the cardboard box. And we want that bed sheet there as a barrier to just protect from any oils or chemicals in the cardboard that might leach into the quilts. And then um, probably the most important aspect is our vapor barrier. So we use a plastic vapor barrier and make sure that it's sealed all the way around. And we do that just in case um, the quilt gets wet in any way. And then we would add another cardboard box to the outside of that, just to make sure they're very secure. And that vapor barrier kind of does double duty to keep the inner box from shifting around. Um, so issues that we might run into with shipping, um, occasionally we do have issues with something like receiving a box that's damaged or wet, but because we follow pretty strict guidelines and we send out pretty strict guidelines to artists and others that we're borrowing from um, to really make sure those quilts are well protected and well padded, we very rarely have any issues with the actual quilts inside. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about loans. Um, so I've shown here four photos from the unpacking process for a recent loan for our Studio Shampoo exhibition. This is a piece by Michael Villarreal. And um, so as you can see, we document unpacking in photos. We also document it in writing. Um, and that way we just make very sure that we're able to send things back exactly as we received them. It just makes things much, much easier, especially with the number of loans that we receive to just have everything documented and then be able to return to that when we need to send things back. And so, of course, we also retain all of our materials for return shipping. We also perform a detailed condition report on each piece that comes in as a loan. Um, that's to protect whoever loaned it to us as well as to protect ourselves. We just want to be sure to take note of any condition issues that might have occurred during shipping or might have already been um, present on the object before it arrived to us so that then um, we know before we exhibit it what issues might be present. So after pieces are have arrived at the museum. Um, they go into a room called isolation, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, so here is our curator of collections, Carolyn Ducey, um, in isolation. And she's doing um, the first step that we do when uh, we receive a piece, whether it's a loan or an acquisition, which is a visual inspection. So we just wanna make sure that there are no issues from um, anything that occurred in shipping, any kind of damage or anything like that. And we're also on the lookout for any type of insect life um, because it's really, really important for us not to introduce any kind of insects into our collection for obvious reasons. So the next step then, once the visual inspection is complete, is to refold the quilt. Um, we always want to avoid whatever fold lines it had when it was um, packed and shipped because um, we're just trying to spread out that stress over the whole surface of the quilt rather than keeping it on those same fold lines because it can break those fibers down over time. And then it's placed in a large Ziploc bag for two weeks. We don't take all of the air out. Um, we get asked that a lot if we vacuum seal the quilts and we do not. Um, the reason for that is just that it's really hard on them to be um, squeezed so tightly to have those folds um, really compressed like that is really damaging to the quilt. So we push most of the air out, but not all of it. And the two week time frame is again, just due to those, due to that potential for insects. So we just wanna make really sure that we're not introducing anything harmful into the collection. So that two week time frame um, will take care of any stage of insect life that might be harbored within that quilt. And then they go on the shelves that you can see um, in the background, and uh, it is a little bit of organized chaos back there. You can see on the tops of the shelves, as I mentioned, those loan packing materials that we retain. So each one has a little note on it telling us which artist it needs to get returned to when the time comes. Um, so then we do have an industrial freezer in our isolation room. It gets down to 40 degrees below zero. And the only time that we use the freezer is if we do see any sign of insect life, dead or alive, on a quilt. 
um, we would freeze it for 48 hours and that would take care of any stage of the insect life cycle. Um, and the other times we would use it would be potentially if we had an exhibition um, that was less than two weeks away by the time we got those loaned quilts in hand, um, we might need to freeze them in order to make sure they were safe to put in the galleries. But all of those occurrences are relatively rare, but it's great to have the freezer when we do need it. So next I'd like to talk a little bit about our workroom. Um, so this image shows you our Byron and Sarah Rhodes Dillo Conservation Workroom. Um, pictured here is Teresa Durye Wong with our Grace Snyder hexagon quilt. Um, and it is um, really a beauty as you can see. But as you can see, we have these large tables in the workroom that, were, that are on wheels. So we're able to push those together um, as needed. Usually we have them in four sets of two, but for a really large piece, we might uh, move more of them together. Um, and so this is where most of the care of the collection takes place. Um, you can see that we have a lot of storage uh, for the cotton bed sheets that we use a lot of um, for bundling up our quilts for exhibition or for other purposes. Um, you can see if you look in the back in that open cabinet, you can see those little baskets. Those are full of the cotton gloves that we wear to um, protect the quilts from the oils on our hands and to protect us from whatever might be on the quilts. Um, you can see a spray bottle on the table there. That is a vinegar and water solution that we use every day to clean the tables before we get any quilts out, um, just to make sure there's nothing on the tables that could be damaging to the quilts. Um, and you can see these carts. We use a lot of those carts to move quilts around. They can hold boxes as well as bundled quilts, as you can see behind Teresa there. Um, so this is, we're very, very lucky to have this space. And if you've been to the museum, you know um, there's a huge window as basically one wall of the workroom. So when you come to the museum, you can see in and see what people are working on. Um, we have about 30 volunteers who work with us in collections and we couldn't do what we do without them. They're amazing. Um, you'll see several pictures of them as we move through the slideshow here, but um, we're very, very lucky to have them work with us. So next I'm going to talk a bit about cleaning. So the only cleaning that we do is vacuuming. Um, so we use variable speed Nilfisk vacuums and we use plastic screens. You can use fiberglass um, finished with bias tape. And that bias tape is just to keep those edges from abrading the fibers. Um, so we keep a glove on our non-vacuum hand. There's not really much of a point in wearing one on your vacuum hand. It's just clumsy. Um, we use the lowest speed of those variable speeds. And it's really important to hover over the screen just barely above it. We don't wanna to touch the vacuum to the screen because obviously the quilt is right under that and it could really damage it. Um, and for deteriorating silks, it's really important to wear a mask and nitrile gloves to protect from metal particulates that can be released by vacuuming. Um, so usually we vacuum pretty much always unless it's a very small piece vacuum with two people um, and just kind of coordinating and moving around the quilt, the front and the back get vacuumed. And the reason for vacuuming is that um, we want to pull out the dust because it has sharp edges on a microscopic level that can be really damaging to the quilt. And um, we use the screens because we don't want to pull up any fibers from the quilt. We're just trying to get that dust out. So we get a lot of questions about washing and you may have even noticed in the workroom image that we do have a washer and dryer but we don't ever use it for quilts. Um, the washer and dryer is strictly reserved for uh, gloves and sheets and things like that. We never wash quilts. So the reasons for that are several. Um, a big one is dye bleed. We can't predict what will happen to the dyes in the quilts um, if, they are, if they get wet if they have soap added to them, agitation. Um, we also can't predict the chemical reactions that may take place 
with dye or with stains that um, then once they've started, we can't stop. And those can even take place just from getting a quilt wet. It doesn't even have to involve soap or agitation. Just getting it wet could cause a chemical reaction that then we're no longer in control of. Um, washing, especially in a modern washing machine, also weakens the integrity of the quilt. Um, it may shrink and damage the fibers, which can then lead to split seams, particularly if there wasn't a, a huge seam allowance to begin with. If it shrinks, it can just pop the seams right open. Um, it can also make existing holes a lot worse. So basically, anything that comes in, even if it has significant staining um, or doesn't smell great at all, it's just part of the story of the quilt. Vacuuming really generally tends to help a lot with odor issues, but in terms of stains, it's just part of the life of the quilt and we don't try to remove it because the alternative could be a lot worse. So the next step in the process when a piece comes into our collection is accessioning. So this is the process by which a quilt or other object enters our collection. So we take measurements, we note the techniques that are used, um, we do a fiber analysis, which generally is visual, but um, under certain circumstances, we do use microscopy to determine for sure um, we take note of any inscriptions, and that could be anything from a single set of initials to an artist label to a signature quilt with hundreds of signatures. Um, it really varies. Um, and then we also identify the pattern. So like in this um, sampler quilt that's on the table here in the image, uh, we would have had six different blocks to identify. We also identify what type of binding was used, if we can tell. Um, a lot of the time we can't be certain, but sometimes there will be areas where it's sticking out of the quilt and we're able to ascertain, well, it's definitely wool or it's definitely cotton. And sometimes um, with certain batting like polyester, it's pretty obvious visually whether or not um, polyester was used. We also just take note of how the binding is put on. Is it a bias binding? Is it knife edge? Um, and what type of borders there are, if any. Now you might notice here that um, Bridget is not wearing gloves and she is actually sewing the accession number on. So that would be sewing something onto the quilt, the, either the accession number or a sleeve, which I'll get to in a bit. Um, those would be the only times that we would handle the quilts without gloves on. And um, so we always wash our hands immediately before doing whatever sewing needs to be done and then promptly put gloves on afterward. But it is pretty uh, clumsy to try to sew with those cotton gloves on. So the accession number or object number just tells us um, a specific identifier for each object in the collection. So the first number is the year it came in, the second is the acquisition group within the year, and the last number is the group within or the piece within the acquisition group. So this is our object survey form. This gets filled out for every single thing that comes into our collection. Just thought it might be interesting for people to see. Um, and this coordinates with our in-house database really well. So once this is all filled out by our volunteers or staff, um, then all this information is entered into our in-house database. And so then we can search if we need to say search for all of the foundation hand pieced quilts in the collection or something like that. We can do that pretty quickly and easily. Um, and most of this information or a lot of it um, then is uploaded onto our in-house or sorry, our online database as well. So the next step is condition reporting. Um, so this is exactly what it sounds like. We do this with loans, as I mentioned, as well as every piece that comes into the collection. Um, and basically we're just looking for any issues that might pose a problem for exhibition later or just that we wanna keep an eye on. Um, things like stains or holes or abrasions or loose seams or loose threads. Um, and we condition report the front and back of every piece. Um, and I'll show you here 
our condition report form. So you'll notice that it's blank. Um, we don't pre-print the quilt shapes onto these just because we have enough objects that are um, non-standard in the collection that it wouldn't actually save us much time on um, things like clothing or um, art quilts that maybe aren't shaped like a traditional bed quilt or things like that. So whoever is doing the condition report just goes ahead and draws the outline front and back of the piece they're working on. And then as you can see, uh, we use this little key um, to note any issues such as stains, ripped seams, tears and fraying, abrasions, holes and shattering that we might find give the quilt an overall condition according to um, how, what type of shape it's in and um, then just make some notes on the overall condition. So these are really helpful, not just for determining whether pieces are strong enough to be exhibited, but also just to provide a record, a baseline um, through time so that we can go back and look and see if a piece has had significant fading or if other issues such as shattering have gotten a lot worse um, over since it came into the collection. So after a piece has been accessioned and condition reported, um, then it moves to our photo studio. So this image is taken from the loft where our camera lives. So as you can see, we have a two-story photo studio, which is really, really helpful for photographing quilts. If you've ever tried to photograph a quilt, you know it can be really tricky to get a full-on flat shot of it. Um, and so we're able to do that with even really large quilts using this setup. Um, and so generally our collections team um, which is our collections assistant, Jamie Swartz and I will take an afternoon or so and wheel a couple carts full of quilts in. And um, he is able to run the camera from the computer in the photo studio and we just lay them out together, take the photo, fold them back up and it's pretty efficient and we're able to get through a surprising number of quilts that way. Um, so we do this not just so that we have a record of the quilt, but also, um, these images are shared then on social media, on our website, they are publication quality. So many of them um, have been published in all kinds of different, um, for all kinds of different purposes. Um, we've had textbooks and catalogs and um, they've illustrated essays and all kinds of things. Um, so we do occasionally run into challenges um, with really, really large pieces. We have a handful of pieces in the collection that are so large that they were not able to be photographed um, even with the camera zoomed all the way out. So with those, we usually shoot them in quarters and then they are stitched together in Photoshop, which is kind of a tricky job, but so far so good. So I mentioned this earlier, but if you're interested in seeing some of those photos, you can go to our website, internationalquiltmuseum.org backslash collections backslash search. And as you can see, you can look um, quilts up by pattern, by country, by techniques. Um, if you are curious if we have a particular quilt maker in the collection, you can search there. Not all of our collection is online yet, but um, the majority of it is. There are thousands and thousands of quilts you can see and other objects. So after the quilts are photographed, um, then they make their way to storage until and unless they're pulled out for exhibition or some other reason. So this is an image of our collection storage area. Um, as you can see, it's, there are a lot of boxes. That's the primary way that we store quilts. Um, so when a quilt is getting ready to go in a box, we layer acid-free tissue over the top and then fold it up to the size of the box and we make sure to avoid any existing fold lines and also to avoid um, folding in halves or quarters at all. Um, and then they go into an acid-free archival cardboard box. Usually we have about two quilts per box, it kind of depends on size and condition, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, we also have a rolled storage area and for that, we use acid-free cardboard tubes and we use 
brand new white 100% cotton sheets or unbleached muslin, depending on the size of the piece. And so we make sort of a sandwich with those, basically a sheet, then the quilt, then another sheet, and then that is carefully rolled up with um, the onto the tube and we always use at least two people sometimes three to really make sure that we're not telescoping or bunching any of that fabric up and then our other storage method is flat storage so flat storage is definitely the best way to store textiles but it's also cost and space prohibitive so we kind of have some triaging decisions to make when we're going to put something in flat storage. We look at a lot of different factors. Um, so one of those is condition. Um, is it in weak enough condition or fragile enough condition that it really ought to be flat and not folded or rolled? And we also look at structure. What I mean by structure is, um, is it constructed in a way that would make it difficult to fold or roll. So that might be a piece like this, which you may recognize from um, our recent Old World Quilts exhibition, which has a lot of metallic thread. Um, so we would really not want to try to fold this or really even roll it. Um, we would definitely have concerns about the metal abrading the other fibers. Or it could be something like um, uh, heavily interfaced and or heavily machine quilted newer quilt that would be damaged um, and permanently misshapen by folding or rolling. Um, we also look at what types of embellishments are on it, which could mean things like the metallic thread on this quilt. Um, for our newer art quilts, it also might mean things like paint, beads, um, some pieces that have been applique on with fusibles, things like that that mean that it will be safest if it's flat. Um, we also look at the materials. A lot of our silk quilts end up in flat storage because they are very fragile. Um, but that also could be for something newer, something that uses a lot of interfacing might need to be flat again so that it doesn't end up misshapen. Size is another big factor. Um, unfortunately, we have the largest flat storage units that we can get. However, some of our largest quilts are just too big to go in them. And so um, those we just have to take care of as best we can safely without being in flat storage because in order to fit on the drawers, they would have to be partially folded anyway. And age is another consideration. This quilt in the picture is about 300 years old. So you can see why we really want to try to preserve it absolutely as carefully as we can. So now I'll talk a little bit about ongoing care. So that's kind of how pieces come into the collection and take their place. This is going forward, it's going to be more about what we do to take care of them on an ongoing and sort of rotating basis. So one of the biggest jobs in collections is refolding. Um, this is a job that a lot of our volunteers love and I can see why it's a great way to see thousands of quilts if you stick around long enough, and many of which have never even been exhibited. So we refold on a two year schedule, just trying to kind of find a good spot in between um, not handling the quilts too much and not letting them sit with those same fold lines for too long. So as you can see, our volunteers here are unfolding east to west and so once they've got the quilts unfolded, they will switch sides of the table or rotate one around one side and refold north to south. And they'll be sure to really avoid the fold lines as much as they can. Um, I'm not sure if this will work, but if you look here and here, you can kind of see those existing fold lines. So they would definitely be working to avoid those. And the reason for that, as I mentioned earlier, is just that those um, fibers will really break down over time where they are stressed. There's not really a great way to avoid that short of having everything flat. Um, and so the solution for us is just to try to spread that stress over a little at a time over the entire quilt rather than in specific areas for a long time. So 
it might sound complicated to be constantly refolding and refolding every two years, um, but we use a pretty simple dating system that works really well. We have colored stickers that go on the labels on the boxes. They look just like what you'd use to put labels, price labels on at a garage sale or something. And each year gets its own color. And then we write the year and the quarter that it was last refolded on that sticker. And those are all replaced each time it's refolded. And so then when our volunteers are looking for what needs refolded, they can just walk down one of the storage aisles and look for say, yellow stickers and then, then narrow it down by quarter. So it makes it pretty efficient. Um, another thing that we do is more vacuuming. Um, so anytime one of our permanent collection piece is exhibited, it is re-isolated and re-vacuumed just in case the isolation is just in case there were any um, insects present in the galleries from brought in from outside or anything like that. And then the vacuuming is just to, again, pull out any dust that might have become attached to the quilt while it was on exhibition. So this is a really large piece. As you can see, um, this is made to go with the play, um, the quilters and a local community college group put this on at the museum a couple of years ago. And so this quilt hung in the reception hall for only a few days, but um, it still spent the two weeks in isolation and then was re-vacuumed front and back before it was put away. We also do object reviews before every exhibition. Um, and these are really important. It's kind of a collaboration between our collections team and our exhibitions team. Um, we really want to determine whether the condition of the quilt is good enough to be exhibited. Just make sure there aren't any stains or holes or anything that weren't necessarily noted that were somehow missed in the initial condition report. Um, it's also helpful to make sure that the quilt looks as it does in the photo. Um, some quilts, you may have experienced this before, some quilts look very different in photos than they do in person. And so it's really helpful to be able to see the actual quilt to determine its fit in a given exhibition. Um, we also really are taking a look for stability. So the front of a quilt might be in beautiful shape, but if the backing is coming apart, then that's going to be a big problem for putting a sleeve on it and hanging it. And so um, we take a look to make sure the quilts seem stable enough to be exhibited. And if they don't seem stable, then we talk about alternative methods that we may end up using, including um, showing a quilt flat on a slant board or on a padded roll in order to provide some extra support. So next, I'll talk about integrated pest management, which is a really important part of taking care of our collection. So um, we are mostly concerned with three types of insects that can be a danger to the collection, uh, carpet beetles, wool moths, and clothes moths. And um, so we have 34 blunder traps around the museum. Um, they're just little triangular sticky traps. They don't attract bugs. They just um, pick up whatever wanders through. So they definitely don't pick up all of the bugs in the museum. It's more of a census taking for us so that we can see what insects are moving around what area. So we pick those up once a month and examine them all under the microscope. Um, and one of our big concerns is always, if we do find something concerning, which trap did it come from? Um, and that's what I mean by proximity. It, how close is it to the collection? Um, how close is it to storage? And if it's by an outside door, that's a lot less of a concern than if it's maybe from within storage or within the workroom. And um, I will just invite you to take a quick break or skip ahead a minute or two if you are watching this recorded, um, if you are averse to insects, but I think they're pretty cool. So we're gonna look at a few. So these are some photos that I took um, from with the microscope, uh, with just with my cell phone looking into the microscope. So this just kind of shows you what those traps might end up looking like. Um, so as you can see, got a couple of spiders 
and um, I don't know which types they are, unfortunately. Uh, they're not a danger to our collection, so I know a lot less about them. And then on the bottom of the trap on the left, you can see a couple of book lice in varying stages of decay. So we see the vast majority of what we see are things like this that are not dangerous, not harmful, just moving around the museum the way they move around any building. However, sometimes we find things like this. Um, on the left, we've got a uh, clothes moth, and we identify those by the body shape and by the pattern on its back and by the shape of its antenna. On the right, um, that is a carpet beetle larva, and we identify those um, they, by their kind of fuzziness and that kind of triangular head and that's the striated pattern on the back, which is a little bit hard to see. We also monitor um, very closely for temperature and humidity. And um, so stability of environment is really, really important for quilts. Um, so ideally, you should keep quilts between 62 and 72 degrees Fahrenheit. We keep our workroom and our storage at a constant 68 degrees. Um, 45 to 55% relative humidity is best for quilts. And um, so we keep ours just about 50% all the time. Consistency is really important. You don't want spikes in temperature or in humidity in either direction because those can cause those fibers to expand and contract and that's really hard on them. And um, a higher humidity is also really bad for quilts as it can cause mold and mildew. So um, when we're going to exhibit a piece, we do put sleeves on it. So we have a wonderful amazing team of volunteers who's been putting our sleeves on for many, many years. This is two of our four right here. Um, so we don't put sleeves on everything. Um, we just do them as needed for exhibition. We use a gusseted muslin sleeve and they use a running stitch to attach it and then kind of a cross stitch on the vertical edges for stability. They only sew through the back and batting layers. We never want to go through the front. And um, we make sure that they're secure but easy to remove because we don't want to do any permanent damage to the quilt. And then um, in terms of professional conservation, we don't have conservators on staff, but we do send pieces out occasionally. So this is a new one. You can see by the accession number there down there that it has not even been accessioned yet. It has a group, but not a number. And um, so this is a silk quilt by Charles Pratt. You can see um, that he stitched these tiny little squares of silk together um, to create these really beautiful images. Um, we have several of his quilts and they are all biblical or historical um, references in the imagery. But if you look closely, you can see this is um, in really rough shape. Um, Charles was very competitive and also very talented. And so he sent his quilts out to hundreds and hundreds of places and um, won hundreds of ribbons for them. But all of that shipping and handling definitely was pretty hard on those silks. So this one was sent out earlier this year for professional conservation. And so we should be getting it back soon. And we're pretty excited about that. Um, this is another piece. I just wanted to show one that had been conserved professionally. So um, this one was conserved in 2012. And you can see that they added a really fine net. Um, it's usually a silk crepeline. I'm not sure if that's what's pictured here, but to this brown fabric that's deteriorating. And that just really um, kind of traps those disintegrating pieces in so that they won't fall completely off. And it also just helps um, the other areas of the quilt to stop kind of abrading that or stops even the tissue from brushing against those deteriorating fabrics and causing more destruction. So I am told that there are a lot of questions. So I'm going to wrap up a couple minutes early to make sure we get to all the questions. Thank you, Sarah. We do. I, I think this is a topic that so many of us, whether you're just kind of curious about how things are done at a museum or if you have textiles of your own, it raises questions for yourself. I tried to put them in a little bit of an order to get through, um, but we're going to go ahead and start with the first one. It is, what process do you have in place for vetting potential acquisitions? 
That's a great question. Um, so we receive a lot of donation offers, and so we have to be um, pretty thoughtful in how we approach them. The three main things that we look at are what condition is the quilt in, um, how does the quilt fit in to our existing collection, do we already have a lot of other quilts like it, whether that means from the same time period or from the same place or in the same pattern. And also, do we have provenance? Is this just an anonymous quilt that someone picked up at an antique mall? Or is this something that we know the maker, we know something about their family, we know why the quilt was made. The more we know about a quilt, the more valuable it becomes to us. Thank you. And really quickly, um, could you say again the name of the netting you used on the quilts quilt that's disintegrating? Oh, um, that's called silk crepeline. Okay. I think there are alternatives to it too, but okay, that's great. one that we're familiar with. Thank you. Um, the next question was, do you ever receive quilts that are stolen or not antiques? Is the organization for those items? Um, to our knowledge, we don't have stolen quilts. Um, generally, we acquire from reputable dealers or auctions um, and people who donate quilts, to my knowledge, generally, if they stole it, they probably wouldn't want to donate it. Um, we have come across a couple of quilts, at least one that I can think of in our collection that had been um, altered by a dealer to replace some damaged fabrics with newer fabrics, which um, we only discovered when um, someone looked at it under a black light and discovered uh, optical brighteners in those fabrics. All right. And then how much square footage do you have for back of the house activities like you're describing today versus the ex exhibit space? Is it all in one building or several? It's all in one building and I would say um, the it's roughly, I don't know the number of square feet off the top of my head, but it's about the same. Um, our collections space and photo studio isolation, all of that are directly under the galleries. So it's pretty much the exact same footprint. How often do you have to use the freezer for bugs? Very rarely, once or twice a year, I would say. And what is the temperature that you freeze? Uh, 40 degrees below zero. What do you do if you find harm harmful insects in the building? It depends on where they are. Um, we immediately contact our um, bug professionals on East Campus and um, they reach out to the entomology department to get us a positive ID on whatever trap we found. And then depending on where the trap was found, we go from there. Um, if it were was near, say, in the shipping dock door to outside, um, we can usually safely spray. However, if we found something in the collection's storage area, then we would first set out pheromone traps for that specific species to just see what we're dealing with. And so far, um, anytime that doesn't happen very often, anytime it has, it's just been a one-off um, bug that crawled its way back there. We've been lucky not to have a serious infestation so far. And I, I guess the follow-up kind of was, if you, have you ever had an infestation of carpet beetles? And if so, how did you get rid of them? Um, not so far. <laughs> okay. Fingers crossed. <laughs> um, next question, how do you determine the batting that was used? Wouldn't wool batting have its own issues? Um, we determine what batting was used if we really need to know for some reason, we'll do microscopy. Um, there's usually, we can usually find a spot where a single fiber of batting is sticking out or where a few fibers are sticking out and we can safely remove one, for instance, um, just from one of the holes where the needle went through. Um, wool batting is not super common, um, but we do find it in some of our 18th and 19th century quilts. Um, so now we're kind of getting into some of the materials. Where can I find acid-free storage tubes? And then there was also a question about um, where we get like the boxes and our supplies like that and what brands um, we use. 
you can we get our roll our tubes for rolling from Hollinger Metal Edge and we generally buy our boxes and tissue from Gaylord. Um, I know you can get acid-free boxes and tissue from the container store and on Amazon if you're not buying in the kind of bulk that we do. And we also sell um, boxes and tissue in our gift shop. Um, where do you find cotton gloves? Uh, we buy those from museum supply stores. I believe our last order was from Gaylord. And then we also had a question of from someone who is a textile conservation student. She wonders why we use why we choose to use cotton gloves. They usually use nitrile or go without depending on the situation. Um, we use cotton gloves because that is we've done a fair amount of research and sometimes we use nitrile, but a lot of the time we use cotton. Our volunteers are most comfortable with cotton and especially because we're taking them on and off so often, it's um, a lot easier to, because basically anytime you're touching the quilt or tissue, you wanna have gloves on. Anytime you're touching anything else, you don't. So in the process of say, refolding a quilt, you would have them off while you set the box down, back on to take the tissue off and lay the quilt out and then refold the quilt and then immediately take them off again. So there's just a lot of on and off and cotton gloves are a lot quicker and easier to take on and off than nitrile. Although um, we do use nitrile gloves for some purposes. Do you vacuum the quilts while they are on display or after it is deinstalled? We vacuum them um, after they are deinstalled. Are quilts in the collection regularly vacuumed on a schedule? They are vacuumed when they come in and anytime they are exhibited, since the purpose is to remove dust and they don't generally get dust on them at any significant level when they are in storage, then we don't vacuum on a schedule. And how often do we refold? Um, we refold each quilt every two years, but if the question is how many days a week is someone refolding, um, it really varies, but probably between two and five days a week under normal circumstances, non-pandemic circumstances. Right. What kind of screens, vacuum cleaners could people use at home to care for vintage and antique family quilts? Um, you can get plastic screen at the hardware store that will work just fine if you put, um, if you just machine stitch bias tape around the edges and then um, you can use your home vacuum if you just go on the very lowest setting um, and just be really careful not to press it to the surface of your quilt. We have another kind of at home care question. What is the best way to remove odors from textiles? I'm thinking about very perfumey detergent or fabric softener, machine washing, airing out, and vinegar rinse did not remove odor. With something like that, if you have um, like a big Ziploc bag that you can store it in for a while, which um, the ones that we get are just, I think they're jumbo Ziploc storage bags and they sell them at Target or Office Depot. And um, if you get some activated charcoal packets and just seal it up with that for a while, we have found that that does really, really nicely on perfume and cigarette smoke and um, pet smells. And how many quilts do we currently have in the collection? Um, I should have looked before I started this. It changes every day. Uh, this, so this one really is tough. We've, what we're getting ready to do a series of videos sharing some recent acquisitions. We've kind of, even through all of um, COVID and such, we have kind of had like a record setting acquisitions year. And so it really does vary from time to time. And so really on any given day, the number could be different than it was the day before. So just to, I'll, I'll mention that as, <laughs> as yeah. someone who gets that question so a lot as well. <laughs> I can be a pro we have over 8,000 objects and over 6,000 quilts, but I can't give you a specific number for sure do, right now. Do you use an in-house system to catalog the quilts? Is it similar to cataloging a book? We do, and it is very similar. Um, I, our collection stacks often remind me of uh, library stacks with like the, um, acquisition numbers subbing in for the Dewey Decimal System on the end of the stacks. We use a FileMaker Pro database and um, everything is cataloged in uh, various different ways, including uh, categorization according to 
um, the nomenclature handbook and categorization according to inscriptions and all of the information off the object survey and condition report forms that I shared earlier. How much of your collection is available online for the public or for the general public to observe and or search through? Most of it is, not all of it yet, um, but I think between two thirds and three quarters is, and we've really been pushing to update that um, during this time that our museum has been closed and we've added several thousand more quilts than were on there um, back in March. We also had a question and I'll actually answer this one. It's are quilts borrowed from for exhibition added to your public database for quilt researchers. So while we do keep track of the quilts that are on display and in our collection as part of the process, we don't actually put them into the public database that we have for search the collections. That's because in search the collections, it's just objects from our collection. Depending on the artist or collector who we're working with, we may put photos and all of the information that we have available in the online exhibition for it. However, some artists, some collectors do not, um, for copyright purposes, want to, to avoid having their, their quotes photographed and information shared on our website. And so we're, we're unable to share in those um, times. However, if you are somebody who's doing research on pieces that have been on display at the museum, and you're, you're working on it, we're always happy to put you in contact with the person who can, can um, is the owner of those quilts down the road. So that's, if you're, if you're looking for something though, I would start with our archive of online exhibitions. Most of them, I, most of them do have the quilts featured on there and with their photos and information that we would have in our database. Um, next question is, what do you use for a photo background? Um, we just have tables like we have in our workroom that are under the quilts and then um, in post processing those are the table is edited out so that we just have the quilt. And do you ever do photography for fiber artists? Um, we occasionally photograph exhibitions or pieces that have been loaned to us at the request of the artist. Um, but to my knowledge, we generally don't do um, photography for the public. I've been told to fold versus roll quilts for storage. What are the pros and cons of each? Um, rolling will make it so that there aren't fold lines, um, providing that you don't, that you're careful not to create any wrinkles or anything like that as you're rolling. Um, it's basically, we would see it as second best to having it just completely flat. Folding, the advantages to folding are just that it's a lot more compact. It requires a lot less storage space. And it's and still that, safe. And we had another question, which was what determines whether a quilt is folded in a box or rolled in that, I think. Kind of. Um, kind of similar things as determine whether it goes in flat storage. Um, like what the materials are, um, whether it can comfortably be folded. A lot of art quilts are fine to be rolled, but would be definitely damaged by folding. I would say art quilts are what most often ends up being rolled, um, but we do have some pieces that are a lot older, especially pieces like um, coverlets or something like a summer spread that's really, really thin. Um, we would tend to probably roll that instead of folding it just because um, we feel like that will be the safest thing for it if it doesn't fit into flat. And these were two separate questions, but I'm going to combine them. It is, do you fold to the inside or to the outside and are rolled quilts rolled with the design facing in or out? Oh, good questions. Okay, so we fold um, with the quilt face up as we're folding so that the back is what's showing in the box and the same with rolling. Um, we fold with the face toward the roll. I know other people do it differently and there are arguments for both sides, but that's how we do it. And I'm, you, you might have answered this one when you're talking about the box, but what brand of acid-free tissue and storage boxes do you use? Uh, we get them from Gaylord. Okay. So it's just their company. Okay. Um, why do you use 100% cotton polyester sheets? Oh, we don't use polyester. Or versus, I'm sorry, versus polyester, I think. Oh. Is how, is the question. Um, it's a little bit 
it's just a precaution we take um, because we feel like we know based on a couple hundred years of evidence how cotton reacts when stored for long periods. Polyester is new enough that it's just not a chance we really want to take that anything might be leaching out of that into our rolled quilts. And um, what kind of thread is used to attach a sleeve? Um, we just use 100% cotton R fill thread. And do you ever remove hanging sleeves or Velcro strips before storing a quilt? We always remove Velcro. Um, we don't exhibit with Velcro ever. Um, I know it was more popular a couple of decades ago, but we anything we get in with Velcro on it, the Velcro is removed really carefully as part of the accessioning process. The only time we would remove a sleeve really is if um, we were going to exhibit the piece and um, the existing sleeve was too small to use or was somehow obstructing our ability to put on a functional sleeve. Otherwise, we would just leave it alone. And we did just uh, ha have a question too of what do you use to launder quilts if they need washing? How do you remove stains? Um, Sarah mentioned that in the presentation earlier, just as a reminder, we don't remove the stains. Um, we consider that to be part of the quilt story. We document each and every one of those stains um, just to make sure again, because there are any number of things that could be a stain on, on a quilt, um, but we, we don't actually remove them for our purposes because we consider that part of the uh, quilt story. There's a question of what do you wash the quilts with? Like, or I'm sorry, not the quilts, the sheets. I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> oh okay. <laughs> sorry, I was, very I was confused. reading two questions <laughs> at once. <laughs> um, we use all free and clear detergent to wash them, so no, uh, no fragrances added, um, just as simple as we can get it. And then we use uh, wool dryer balls in the dryer. We don't ever use dryer sheets or anything like that. And we have a question from someone who asked if our um, forms are available to download for like if they're doing their own library of quilts. They are not currently, um, but that is something we'll look into providing a more generic form um, that people could use at home that doesn't have our information all over it. On that note, um, someone just asked if you had a moment if you could please comment on some ways that you could store your older quilts at home. Sure. Um, we do have a presentation on this from March, right, Laura? Yes. Okay, so that would be, that's a lot, has a lot more detail than what I'll get into right now. Um, you can find on our YouTube channel um, about caring for quilts at home, but the biggest things you want to do are just avoid light as much as possible um, and avoid fluctuations in temperature or humidity. So really avoid those attics and basements. Keep the quilt where it's comfortable for you to live. Um, and if you have a spare bedroom that you can keep pretty dark and store it flat on a bed, that's great. If not, um, storing it folded in maybe a bedroom closet or something like that and just making sure you take it out to refold every couple of years that is a fine solution. You want to be careful with things like cedar chests and cardboard um, just because of what can leach out of them into your quilt. Um, just always want to make sure you're using some kind of barrier like a pillowcase or a sheet if you are going to use something like that. But um, we would recommend storing um, in a new high density polyethylene or polypropylene containers, not your regular Rubbermaid totes um, because those also have chemicals that can leach in from the plastics. And then we do have a couple of questions kind of about acquisitions a little bit. One is, are there any quilts you are looking for to add to your collection? I actually would say like just with the amount of time that we have, we're looking internationally a lot. We are expanding our art quilt collection a lot. Uh, we're often surprised sometimes though that by something that we'll see and, and, and that's something that's exciting for us that our acquisitions committee basically kind of has, they set an agenda that they, they set goals that they're looking for and that's kind of how they, they collect. And that would be just something I would answer as well. Somebody asked um, about 
our policy for collecting contemporary quilts. That's something that the acquisitions committee works towards. If you are interested more about that on our website under collections, we do have information about how about our acquisitions policy and, and there's a form there where you could you could send specific questions to the acquisitions committee and that way you can get you can get a better answer. Um, one question that also came up is as the museum re reopens, which uh, I'll mention, we are opening to the public beginning on Tuesday, August 4th with uh, physical distancing parameters in place, as well as a limited number of people allowed in the building at any given time. But as the museum reopens, do you have any concerns about the new cleaning regimens causing damage to the fibers of the quilts on display? Um, I mean, the good thing about the way our museum functions is that people, it's made very clear to people that they're not supposed to be touching the quilts to begin with. So I think um, we're working with our custodial department to make sure that we're taking the safety of the collection into account while still keeping everything um, as clean as it needs to be. And um, I'm not terribly concerned, especially because storage is entered by very few people. Um, and so I think, I think we have our ducks in a row there. And then I think I, I missed a question. It was um, regarding using pl plastic storage tubs. Like they mm -hmm. asked what kind of plastic storage tubs to use um, if you're using them. Yeah, so um, high density polyethylene or high density polypropylene. If you, I think the number you wanna look for on the bottom is three and five, but you want to double check that. Um, if you do look up that um, Caring for Quilts at Home talk on our YouTube channel, um, I know it's uh, recorded in there, both audio and text on the screen, what you want to look for. And if you go to the collections tab on our website, we also have um, some downloads that you can look at there on our at-home care tips for preserving your collections at home. And then we have a question, is there a quilt that you, is there a quilt that you would refuse or is in so bad a condition it can't be saved? Like meaning for the collection, I believe. So that's kind of a two part question. Um, the answer to both is yes, I guess. Um, we do, based on the volume of donation offers that we receive, we do have to turn down the majority of them um, just because and a lot of the time it's because of condition. Um, we are mostly unable to take anything into our collection that is in a condition that could not be exhibited, um, which eliminates a lot of what we're offered. Um, and then are there quilts that can't be saved? Depends on what you mean by saved. Um, we sometimes recommend to people that if they have a quilt that's meaningful to them, but it's in really poor shape, um, that they actually cut out a block or however much is um, salvageable and maybe if it's a large piece turn it into a baby quilt rather than a full bed quilt. If it's a, just a block maybe frame it and put it in your home so that the quilt can live on in some way. But the bottom line is um, quilts really began as utility objects and sometimes they do get used up. All right, well, thank you so much, Sarah. And I'm sorry, we, we still have a few open questions, but if you, um, I, I think they might take a little bit more time to answer. If you would like to send them on to us, please fill out the form on our website to do so. Thank you everybody for participating today. We hope that you will join us again next week when the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles gives their presentation. Thank you again and take care.